All right, in this video, I want to talk to you guys about a very important principle in pretty much any type of skill that you can learn, which is that you should aim to reduce the amount of aspects you have to learn at once. So what that means is, let's say we start out with simple uh, simple example. If you want to learn to last hit, then ideally you would want to practice that first just by last hitting and once you get that down you want to play against the lane opponent so you're doing one thing at once perhaps you could even if you really wanted to nail this concept down i'm not saying that's the best thing to do but you could even say all right first i'm going to play some customs where i only cs there's no lane opponents and then i actually if if, if this is possible in sand mode probably is i want to just trade with someone just walk up to the lane and trade until we're almost dead, right? And what kind of trades do I want to do? When do I want to step in? How long should I wait for my cooldowns? Right? Just getting a sense of these timings, saying, oh, I should have stepped in earlier, my cooldown was about to come back up, and his weren't yet ready, or the other way around, right? I want to wait longer, right? Just getting a sense for exactly how to trade and exactly how to last hit by practicing it separately. And then after a while, after you get decent at that, or at least have improved on that, you might try a game where you're actually playing against someone who's also trying to last hit and you're doing both things at once. Now that's not always the most effective strategy for a couple of reasons. First of all, CSing can be boring as hell and secondly, the efficiency that you get from CSing, if you if you CS for two hours doing nothing else, do not trading at all, then I don't know, you have to do an experiment with that because honestly I've never done that for two hours straight but in the meanwhile I've played the game for thousands of hours and I've last hit it for thousands of hours so you're getting a little bit more efficiency by practicing this way probably I don't know for sure but probably sure but the cost is that it's very very boring and it's incredibly tedious it's very hard to do that for the same amount of time as you would play the game regularly so you usually want to do this kind of practice, this very separate practice, only if um, if it doesn't make the game incredibly tedious and boring to you, right? There, it is a trade-off. So one of the examples in which I do actually follow this principle of reducing the amount of aspects you want to focus on is when I'm jungling. When you look at my op.gg uh, and you look at my junglers, I've mainly learned to jungle with two champions, Zack and Vi. Now, why Zack and Vi? Very simple, right? They are engaged tanks. At least Vi in the meta that I played it was a tank, right? You would not go Triforce on her unless you were 10 and 0, right? So, Zack and Vi, both engaged tanks, and it's very simple, right? Engaged tanks have a very simple job. They engage and they're tanky, right? So, what you have to do. All I had to focus on when I was jungling was, let's say, um, where's the blue jungler? So let's say the um, I've tracked, I, I'm, I'm just about here, I'm like clearing my gromp or something, but that's pretty close. Let's say I see the jungler do a lane gank and I notice that he took these three camps or something. He hasn't taken his blue buff yet. Now the blue buff is, is quite far away, so I can't really cross this without being noticed. But I know his raptors are up, and I'm a jungler that can take him pretty well. Like, for instance, with Zack, sure, you can take raptors uh, very fast. So what you do is you just hop on over here. If you have to, you could even evade the gromp, evade the, what's it called, rift scuttler, if you really want to be sure. Like, of course, he could have taken this instead of the uh, crux. That wasn't true to when I played it, because then Krux would give you 11 CS, but now that's true, right? Now you don't know, and you can jump over this. And then you get to the Raptors, and you invade this, and you back off. And uh, maybe you look for a mid gank like this, if this is a little bit pushed up, if, or whatever the scenario is. You can just look for that. And you've denied the enemy jungler quite a bit. And y you could do all kinds of strategies. When you just... Um, when you learn to jungle, you learn to pick on a pick up on these things, right? When you're top side and he's bot side, oh, you can evade or you can gank, right? It's like someone's relieved all pressure off of this side of the map that he's not on, right? And it's always just like when you're relatively close, you always have two options, right? Like you can pressure him inside of his jungle or you can counter gank. Sometimes counter ganking works, 
sometimes you're already losing so hard you're gonna be too late and that is the stuff you learn you might walk up there and realize oh I'm too late well then it doesn't work that has nothing to do with your champion mechanics because that's you know not really relevant here right Zack's mechanics are not very complicated so really what you're focusing on all game long is what should I be doing should I be invading uh, you're thinking about pressure you're thinking about gank potential you're thinking about the macro aspects of the game and the reason for that is because you picked something that's mechanically simple so another aspect of the game namely micromanagement mechanics right you don't really have to worry about that as much because those are easy you reduced it by making it simple Right, uh, so that is isn't a case in which I do use it because I enjoy playing Zach, even though his mechanics are simple. Right, so that I think is a very good example of this principle and when to apply it and when maybe it's more murky, maybe not apply it as much. So one more example I wanted to show is um, Warwick because Warwick is very interesting. We're gonna shift the junglers around. Let's say this jungler is nowhere to be found; he's just doing his red buff and you are about to gank this top lane so you're sitting in here in this brush and you're just about to pop out and this guy's just completely clueless right now if you're playing Zack this is quite a simple scenario right like uh, actually with Zack there is also uh, a mechanical aspect to this that I will explain in a second so of course you can try to simplify something mechanics and positioning are always going to be some part of it but when you're playing something mechanically complex, I'm not saying difficult, but complex as Warwick, right? Let's look at this guy, right? This guy's playing Warwick in Gold 5. Now, what I can guarantee you Gold players do when they're playing Warwick is this. They have all, and I've seen this actually happen. I play with Gold players and I've seen this happen. What they, what say 80% of them do is they walk up, and what they do is they alt towards the target, right? I wish I had a symbol to express that. I'm just gonna, okay, well that R doesn't look like anything. So I'm just gonna jump on them. This implication sign means that I'm jumping on them, right? And what happens is after that, these guys flash away. I'm just using these as sort of gap closers or distance, you know, escapes. So. What happens is you alt them, you suppress them, and then they flash away and they're out of range. You have nothing to, you know, get in range anymore. Maybe you can try flashing after them, but maybe they're already too far gone, right? So you blew your chance. Now, is that the optimal way of doing things? Alting in like that? You're suppressing him. You hit the suppress, that's easy, right? You're sort of moving opposite directions. It's easy to, to hit him, right? So why is that not optimal? And the reason for that is because a gap closer is more effective when you're actually using it like this. Oh, when you're using it like this, when someone's direction is parallel with your gap closer, right? Because with walking, you, you don't gain any distance from him. And with the gap closer, you allow yourself to close that gap. But what happens when instead we put these arrows away for a second? We go back to the original situation, all right? So he's here. Your direction of movement is like this. And his crosses your path. So if you don't use any gap closures, you're catching up with the guy because he's not moving parallel to you. He has to, to in order to reach his escape, he has to walk against you, has to meet you halfway. So that's why you want to hold on to this, because you, he's, he's pretty much what's happening is by every second that you wait and don't even move, he's voluntarily moving towards you, right? So why would you close that gap and stop him from moving voluntarily towards you? That's idiotic, right? You want to wait for him to reach you, you taunt him away, right? And then when he flashes, Right when he flashes like this, you boom, you all after him and you hit him, and that's when you should get the kill, right? Because if you don't get the kill, then then it which is the really bad gank because there's no way in hell you could ever get it. So you just walk behind him, uh, you taunt him into the turret, 
right? You, you queue him, but you don't do it in an awkward way. Sometimes when they're using the gap closer instantly, you can even queue right through them for some extra distance. And that's it. You might not even need your ultimate, right? So very important to keep in mind. But my point, my overlying point, this, this might be useful to some of you guys. Maybe some of you already know this. You know to hold on to abilities when movement is against you, right? When it's not parallel to you. And use gap closers when it is finally parallel, right? That's that's reasoning, but um, the underlying principle here is that you should not um, pick mechanically difficult champions when you're still learning the game, when you're still learning the basic principles of macro play, like when to invade, when to push for objectives, when to when to leech someone experience and push something out, and when to leave the wave to someone. When you don't know these things, then you want to focus on that. And that means you don't want to focus on something else at the same time. Because the more things you have to focus on, the less quickly you improve at any one of them. So, um, I found this a really funny thing. Because with Sack, this still applies with this E. But Warwick has so many of these really finicky mechanics. They're not complicated. You don't have to you know, very quickly press large sequences of buttons, but you have to get the positioning just right. You have to uh, not allow someone to get just too far away with your taunt, right? You you have to kind of um, know that, for instance, just, just one of the mechanics, right? If you keep holding the cue uh, on someone without using direct inputs uh, in the route that you want to take, what happens is you start auto-pathing and the two problems with that are first of all it's inaccurate and second of all it sometimes it walks directly to someone rather than predicting where they'll go so you have to use direct inputs and then hover with your cue sometimes and then use direct inputs again and then just get that little bit of distance you need and that has gotten me a shit ton of kills because that's that little bit of extra distance you want and i've missed a shit ton of kills because i didn't do that before that's mechanics right is it complicated is it is it really difficult no but but it's complex there's lots of little things to it right just like his w his w you don't want to tr you want to trigger it if you think you're going to kill a target and then one that you actually blood hunt is going to survive and you can keep walking but you don't want to use it when you don't really need it but the stop that you get from from the w right the little bit of channeling puts you at more distance right then it's not a good thing to use these little things it's not a big thing it's not higher it's not rocket science but there are little things that can get you that kill that you can or that can completely make you feel to get that gank off you know so that's that's it right like that's why you don't want to pick mechanically complicated gems because when i play warwick i'm just thinking about those things right like i should di just behind the champion here and then hover my queue and I'm trying to get it exactly right and if I do then there's a huge reward so it makes sense but then I'm not really focusing on improving my macro play so I've only done that when I feel like I got the basics of that down right and when I when a new Pandora's box of macro play opens up and I'm like oh I have to learn these things and really master them then I'm gonna go back to playing Zack and Vi because Warwick is not the best champion to do that with right so you want to think about these things, reduce the aspects, and you want to look at like how tedious does the game become because of that. Because obviously enjoyment is an aspect of this game too. Even of improvement, if you're not enjoying yourself and you're completely going against your own emotions, you're not very likely to stick with that very long and improve. So no matter how what way you look at it, you always have to look at the trade-off. But that's kind of my reasoning with um, how exactly to do this, how exactly to apply yourself this way and improve faster and enjoy the game more so i hope you guys found that useful and i'll see you guys in the next one